What's up, everyone? This is Niyi Adewale, host of the Akaba Home Financial Freedom Mastermind Group. This group meets virtually every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern, and the members of this group are committed to achieving financial freedom well before the traditional retirement age. So in this podcast, you are going to get VIP access to the conversations we have about different forms of investment and creative ways to get your dollars working harder for you than you originally worked to obtain those dollars. I'm truly excited. We're joined by Jordan Spector, who is actually one of my former teammates at Temple University. And I can tell you that when we weren't trying to knock each other's block off, he was leaning into his true passion of creating incredible pieces of art. I've actually had the privilege and the honor of owning one of those pieces, and we'll get into which one a little bit later. But Jordan Spector is the CEO of Spector Sports Art. And as a full-time artist, he's delivered pieces to the likes of Drew Brees, Brian Dawkins, Devontae Smith. He's done Colin Kaepernick pieces. He's done the Mailman piece for Georgia. He's done Burrow pieces, things that you've probably seen on social media all around. And we're happy to have him here with us because he's not only mastered the art of creating those pieces, but he's mastered the art of digital marketing and effectively turning his passion into a profitable full-time business. Jordan, thank you for joining us tonight. Man, what an intro. Appreciate you having me on. <laughs> hey, I, I, I can't do you justice. Like literally, I, I've been had the pleasure of following your journey for a, a while, right? For, I want to say over seven years, just watching in the background before finally being able to jump out and capture one. But no, Jordan, it truly is a pleasure to have you here, man. And I'm just excited to dive into your story. Yeah, man. Seven years. Wow. Flew by, huh? Yeah. <laughs> actually, it actually didn't fly by, but <laughs> it, it feels that way initially when I think about it. Absolutely. And before we jump into some of the incredible accomplishments and, and some of the tips that you have, I really want to take it back to the beginning, right? Before you went into full-time artistry and started Spectre Sports Art, what were you doing? Well, it all started at Temple, as you know. And like you said, football was really the last point before I began art again. So I got hurt playing. I got another concussion and at a certain point, I just didn't want to mess with that part of our health anymore. You know what I mean? So I didn't think I had a great shot at the NFL. So I made a, a executive decision to walk away, which was really, really tough, but I'm glad that I did. And then I naturally went back to art because art was always a hobby for me. It was always just a fun thing for me to do. And I kind of lost my I lost touch with it going into college <clears throat> just because I was distracted by football and going to parties and trying to have a good time and trying to study and, you know, do, do a little bit of everything. So I, I got back into it. It was kind of ironic timing as well because a, a friend of mine's mother, uh, she said to me one day, I still remember this, she was like, because she's an artist too, and she knew, she knew in high school I, was, I had the talent to create art, and she was like, Jordan, you know, you, you never – never waste your talents, never waste your talents. She would say that to me. And it just kind of lit off a light bulb in my head a little bit. And it was like, you know what? You're right. <laughs> so, you know, multiple factors played into me picking back up on it. But the difference this time was because of football and still having that passion for it, I started doing pieces of guys that were playing on the team, like Tyler Medikevich, who was just an all-star. And I you know, I, I was inspired by him to make something of him looking all jacked up, bigger than he actually was, which he liked. But yeah, man, that, that's that's really how it started, me just getting into it and, and doing that. for. And then, you know, one, one thing after another, I would do another illustration, I would do another illustration, and people started to pay me to make a drawing. And I was like, wow people will pay me to do this. It's pretty, that's pretty cool. And this is the middle of college and junior going into senior year and starting to, you know, think about what I'm going to do next. So that's how it started. And, and I never stopped since then. It, it, it only got bigger and better from there. So and that was probably 2015. 2015. No, that's, yeah. that is awesome. And the one thing that you mentioned that that other artist kind of bestowed <clears throat> upon you was 
never wasting your talent, right? And you mentioned that art had always been a hobby and that you, you did have an affinity for it. But there's a lot of things that I do as a hobby. I used to love playing chess, but you're not going to see me on Queen's Gambit, you know, taking down anybody, <laughs> right? And so well, now you can try. <laughs> I, I could try. I could definitely try, but I, I, you know, we'll, we'll see how far that goes. But how were you able to even get the courage to really lean heavy into that? You mentioned that you started to get some commissions, but it, I, I'm assuming it wasn't enough to pay the bills early on, when did you realize, hey, I could really take this to the next <laughs> level and make this a full profession? That took time to get to that point because that was a, a battle for me. One, number one, just having the time to take on enough work when I'm in school. So it definitely, it couldn't happen when I was in school, but I just, I just, I didn't stop as, and I just kept going. I, I tried to put a little bit of time into it every day, a little bit of time into my craft every day. And I started to feel that and notice that and try to make it a habit. And a lot of things in life are habitual. You know, you got to do something enough to make it a habit. So just getting in that rhythm at the minimum was, was important to me. And just growing social media and, and starting to set up some e-com stuff on Etsy.com. And just so many little things I started to tap into. It wasn't until, because I, I actually committed to, to continuing education into grad school, which was part of my educational plan, which I just went for it. And I continued to do art while I was in school. And that became more and more of a conflict of interest because it was like I was committing full-time hours to art and school. And when you're in grad school for a doctorate program, that is not easy. So... <laughs> I was kind of an outsider a lot of the time because I had this this tough balance of not only school and still trying to have a good time with, with the new friends I made and that new community, but also this whole business side that I'm running, you know what I mean? And people would always, you know, kid and, and, and make fun of me for being on phone calls between classes or doing something, you know, they'll always up, oh, Jordan's on another phone call, Jordan's talking to somebody, you know what I mean? So acting like I'm all important or something, but I really had an important phone call, you know? So it just transpired through that, through that process or through that time in school and just went from there. It wasn't until I was done school, go figure. And this is two years ago that it really kind of went to the next level. That's 2019. And ironically that like that, the rest of that year is kind of building, building, building. I, I actually got this one huge project, which is that Eagles piece. I, it started all the way back in 2019, that commission job, which was huge for me. And I just, I just continued from there. But it wasn't until 2020 going into the pandemic that it ironically took off, you know, and, and a lot of things started to change. Absolutely. And it's crazy. Hello. There she goes. <laughs> <laughs> say hi to all the all the viewers <laughs> <laughs> and it's and it's crazy that you were the, the timing everything right because had the pandemic happened sooner who knows if you would have been able to make some of those connections right as far as the in-person connections that led to some of those commission roles and I know that one of the things that you mentioned is never take opportunities for granted because you never know who you might meet or where those connections will bring you could you just talk about even how you got to that Eagles piece you just mentioned, where did that come from? It's such a great story. It's such a classic opportunity story because that's how a lot of these things happen. You, you take a call or you listen to somebody trying to, trying to throw you a bone and you just take it for what it is. You don't say no, you know, I still, you, you start to realize when to say no, when to say yes, but it's still kind of a battle, but opportunity is good. You know, and uh, for that, for that job, it started because while I was in school, this is like in my last year of rotations, I, I get a message from somebody who bought a print of Brian Dawkins on my Etsy page, not even the, the bigger site I have now on the Etsy page. And they made a little note. They, they, all they said was, they didn't send me a message. They made a note. They said, oh man, I can't wait to get this signed by Brian Dawkins. I was like, oh, so I reached out to them and said, hey, you know, you're going to be meeting Brian Dawkins. What's going on with that? And then all of a sudden, it, it quickly led into this bigger conversation of him saying, hey, yeah, my, actually, my buddy is hosting Brian Dawkins for this big event and all this stuff. And he's like, you know what? He'd probably love to have you. He'd probably love your work. Maybe you can come and like 
display some work that we'll sell for charity. They had like a charitable aspect to it. So next thing you know, they flew me up from Florida for a day to come to this event at this guy's really, really nice home. And leading up to that, I put some things in place to make sure I had some reproductions ready for the event, some canvases and stuff. And I brought a massive canvas of the Dawkins piece that I did because I was like, I'm finally going to get to like be in there with Doc. I've met him before, but kind of, sort of, but like, I'm going to get to be close up personal with them. So I prepared for that. I, I went to the event and, you know, it, it just, it was a perfect scenario. And uh, not only did I, I sold all the stuff that I brought, but I also got to present that to Dawkins and we got some pretty awesome pictures together and I just planted some seeds. You know what I mean? I just really, I'm really always trying to make sure I'm connecting with as many people as I can. I don't even think about it really. I just do it. I don't know where that comes from, but but that just happens, you know what I mean? And I'm always, I'm always planting those seeds. So that's how I met the owner of that property and come about, this was a year pretty much prior, it was 2018. We stayed in touch, continued to build that relationship. And he at that event had mentioned to me this idea of this iconic, you know, Eagles artwork for, for his place. And I could tell he's an art guy. He's got some really cool stuff. And, you know, we vibed on that. So come literally like a year later, finally, I, I hit him with, you know, the size of this thing that we're going to do and, and a price, which was a, a price for me at that time. That was like, whoa, you know what I mean? I'm just going to do it though. <laughs> <laughs> and I did that. And he's like, you know what, this is, this is reasonable. I can do this. And I was like, bet. And that, you know, that, that was really cool. And that's another thing too, like whatever business you're in, like you're going to have transactional thoughts or decisions to make. And sometimes you just got to go for it and, and invoice somebody bigger money than you're comfortable with. But that's because it's you. You're not used to dealing with bigger money and people who are, who are going to invest in whatever it is that you're offering or selling. So that was a really cool learning lesson as well. And that helped me kind of change the gears a little bit as well for, you know, what am I, what am I going to charge for my time to do that? you know and that and after the fact it's funny because that actually wasn't enough <laughs> <laughs> for the amount of time it took but but that was a good learning lesson and, and that right there is a gem right don't sell yourself short and i think for all yeah. the members of the akaba home financial freedom mastermind group as well as the listeners that's huge the value that you're bringing to this world at times we can because we're in our own body we can almost put a cap or a limit on that but you have to ask for your worth and maybe a little bit above that, man. Inflation, you got to take the prices up. You got to take the prices up nowadays. Yeah. And, and to your point, you did put in a lot of work and I've seen that piece and I've seen some of the videos and the pictures. It's incredible. Would you mind just giving the dimensions of that piece just so the listeners know? That's 38 inches tall by 180 inches long, <laughs> which is 15 feet long by a little, a little bigger than three and a half feet tall. So it's huge. And then to frame that thing, which, which we later on added to the project, I searched to so many different framers to anybody who would at least frame it and nobody would even touch it because it was so big. And one guy locally actually did the job and, and he crushed it, but it was that big that they don't even make the materials for frames that big. So he had to do a custom fusing and, you know, but it's incredible. If you, if you see in person, it, it is really incredible, you know? So. And that, that is awesome. And it's, it's truly like, when you look back, hindsight's 2020, <laughs> now you can see where the connections like, okay, I met this person and it led to this. I got to meet weapon X and I got to do this commission piece. And now I'm kind of off to the races, but had you not, you know, reached out to that one contact that said, Hey, you know, I'm going to go get this signed by Dawkins and followed up and continue to build those relationships you may not be where you are right now. And it just goes to show you, you, like you said, you never know what interactions are gonna lead to something bigger down the road. You've gotta to continue to have those interactions, continue to talk about what you're doing. And it's, it's crazy how the world will conspire to help you achieve your goals if you put it out there. It's a real thing. Yes, vibes. And, <laughs> but, hey, come on now. And, and one thing I really wanted to dive into, right, is 
you mentioned that in 2015 is when you really started getting back into it, right? But that it didn't get full time until around the 2019 period when you got out of school. When did you hit profitability to where you were like, hey, I can do this full time and I can really actually live the life I want to live and continue to travel and things of that nature through my art? It was 2019 transitioning into 2020. Really, I mean, prior to that, I thought I was making a living off of it, but not really. I was actually, you know, I was making more money than everybody else in school, you know what I mean? Because I'm, but I'm putting in that time to do that. So, yeah, it wasn't until that transition time that it really was sustainable. And, and that, that could be the scary part about entrepreneurship and any business is that nothing's really guaranteed. And it's kind of, you know, it's always on you, you know what I mean? So like now I do have certain things contracted and I'm always just trying to stack. I don't like, I'll like, I don't care how I get it done. I might end up taking longer than I say it's going to take, but I'm going to get it done. And, and I, I'm going to make sure I do the best job that I can, but I want to get that on the schedule. I want to get that ahead of time. So I already know, you know, boom, I'm doing my own thing here, but I have this contract job coming up as well that I, that I can work on, you know, and it's a balance of that. So it is, it is a tough game to play. (laughs) Absolutely. And to your point, there's a lot of listeners that are currently working a W2 and maybe have a side hustle. And, you know, some people are like, Hey, I just want to jump full time into the side hustle and, and go into that. But I would caution you a little bit because what you just mentioned is true, right? There's, there's no parachute and there's no guarantee when you move into this entrepreneurial game right? When you're in a W-2, yes, there might be some meetings where it's like, hey, why am I involved with this? Or a bunch of reports where you could be doing something else more productive. But you know that whether you worked or not that day, you're going to get that check every two weeks, right? It's going to hit your account and you kind of have a balance. When you move into the entrepreneurial space, if you don't work and you don't produce, you don't eat. And so you really do have to be good with your finances to your point. And you have to make sure that you're putting aside some reserves to, mm-hmm. you know, save for a rainy day and that you're continuing to bring in more business. And I really want to get into that more business piece. Like I said, I've been following you on Instagram and seeing kind of some of the posts for many years before I purchased. And I think one, that consistency is key, which you, you mentioned earlier. Lower. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. I, I, but I was seeing, I was like, man, this dude's, this dude's pretty good. He's getting, he's getting better and better. And, and so awesome. from, a, from a digital marketing <clears throat> standpoint, right? When it comes to getting the word out, I got to say, you're, you're in my tops, right? In the tops of the people I follow it, being able to get that word out from the progress videos you drop to the release of limited edition pieces. I really want to dive into your digital marketing strategy, how you developed it and, and kind of, you know, tips that you can give to the listeners for that e-commerce type of business or digital marketing. Man, there's so many hacks to that game. And, and I love it to a certain extent. Like I love, I love that side of it. It can be overwhelming at times, but I've slowly, as we've talked about, I've, I've been trying to put the right people in place to help with various things that I'm doing because it's a big operation that people don't see. But yeah, man, I mean, I mean, number one for me, for anybody, social media, you got to start social media and just try to get content, create content, just put something out there. And I don't know why this is popping in my head now, but a good point overall for anybody is don't get caught up in like the little details. And especially so many artists of, of mine that are one, one guy in Philly, he is the most talented artist I've ever known or seen still to this day. And I love his work. And he just never had the knack for the business side and even making a website and stuff like that. So I actually made his website for him on Shopify just because I know Shopify so well. I made it in a day or two. And that over a year or two, that has brought him so much value because he had people stack lining up like, hey, can I buy a print of this? Can I buy a print of this? So you got to have some somewhere to, to push people. You know what I mean? So social media, landing page of some sort, you know, Akaba Home, am I saying that right? Akaba Homes, yeah. Akaba Homes, you know, you have Linktree. 
and that that's a landing page. Somebody can go there. They can go somewhere else. It's a network. So so those two components right there are very important. And if you haven't done it before, it, it it's it's tedious and it's time consuming and it's it could be stressful, but it can happen. And once you learn it, you just learn a whole new skill. That's the other thing too. That that's the confidence that I have now is that listen, like if I stop being an artist tomorrow, well, I could, I could lead a marketing team for this company at the same time. Like I just know so much just by doing it on my own. And that is one benefit of building your own business and building a lot of these digital marketing strategies over time. It's definitely a, a cool skill to have and, and to, to know that you've learned. So to continue on, on the digital marketing hack, you know, like I said, social media, website, Shopify, I always recommend to people it's so easy to build on and it's so easy to scale and their customer service is, is the best out there. And then, you know, tapping into more finite marketing as well. Email, email is huge still today. Yes. Email is number one for me. And a lot of people still use email and even Shopify has a free email CRM version where you can up to a certain amount a month, you can send emails out to a subscriber list that you build for free. And then after that, there's plenty of good options out there. I use something called Klaviyo for email marketing. And you basically pay based on subscribers, right? And there's a strategy on there to actually scrub your list every now and then to try and get rid of people who aren't engaging because it really is another form of social media, right? You want people engaging, opening your emails, clicking through to your website, stuff like that. So, um, you know, that that's another easy thing to get going. And just like I said, starting with that that free option on Shopify. And then you got SMS as well, which, which is a little more complex and expensive, but there's that as well. And then you got social media, website, email, SMS. I'm trying to think what else, you know, obviously there's paid advertising as well that you can eventually get into. And, and although paid advertising is a little bit of a dicey game, you got to be careful and you, you want to eventually find the right person that's going to strategize that with you. And I have a little team that I do that with for marketing, Facebook advertising, Instagram advertising. And now I do a little bit of, of a budget towards Google as well. But that is part of what took everything to the next level in going into 2020. That was an e-com boom going into the pandemic. And luckily, I had some of these pieces already in place and, and hit the ground running. So once I saw the power of that, the, the scalability of that, it was a game changer. Because now I can, I can pay to put my art, product, whatever it is, in front of more people. and cut and chop and edit and learn what works, learn what people are engaging with, learn what people want to see, want to hear. And it just goes and goes and goes from there. So that's, that's another, another way mm -hmm. to, to kind of get the word out. But to your point, you mentioned a bunch of different methods for getting that word out. And one that you mentioned, that's a, a bit of an old school way, but the, the email, right? You said that's still super powerful. How often do you recommend sending out emails to that subscriber base? And, and what do you really include in those? Like, is it limited editions? Is it, what's the content in some of those emails? I actually, I haven't used it in a little bit, but I've actually subscribed to somebody else who gives on a weekly basis, his recommendations for different excuses to send an email. Hey, my one company, cause he actually, he, does this for a living. He's like an email guru. So, Hey, this one client of mine did this email, check it out. This is what they said this is what they talked about. Check this one out. And it will show you like the open rates, the click rates on it and stuff like that. But aside from that, and, and sometimes I slack on that a little bit, which that's pressure I put on myself. But I think if you're doing at least one email a month, that that's really good, especially for art. You don't want to bombard people, but you also have flows. So the cool thing with, with Klaviyo or a lot of these other email, email CRM companies is that you can set up a lot of different flows. So that's constant engagement for different reasons. So like if you land on my website, right, you're going to see a pop-up. It's going to say sign up for 20% off and email. And then it's actually double opt-in where you can provide your phone number and then you're going to get the discount. So email goes to the email system. Phone number goes to the SMS system, and then they get automated, automa automated, sorry, 
automated emails and, and text messages about signing up. And that's already set that flow. So that's engaging with them and they get their discount and then they can use that immediately for their purchase if they want. So it's a really cool way to build the community and welcome them in to my email community where they're going to get the first taste of an upcoming piece, even before I post on social media usually, or like an upcoming sale that I'm doing or whatever the case is. So I, I could I could not send an email for months, but people are still going to get some of this automated email stuff, which is good. I even have like a welcome flow. So like when people first join, aside from the, the other flow that they signed up for, they're going to get this welcome flow that introduces my artwork. And then there's another email and another email. It's, it's a step-by-step. -step, so it kind of like introduces them and then it shows them some reviews that I have about the artwork. And then it shows them other stuff in, in email three and four, you know, and I haven't edited those in, in, a, in a long time and they're still great. You know, it's, it's information on there that can be used for a long time, you know, but as far as doing emails in general, I think once a week is great. Once a month, at least I usually try to do once a month, like overall, Hey, here's what's going on. Here's what I just completed. Here's what's coming up. And the other thing that I learned that works well for me, and I feel like this is why my open rate is really high now. And it also, like a lot of the same people in email, follow me on social media, but I try to be as personal as I, as I can be. I just talk. When I'm typing, I'm, I'm talking to the audience and I'm saying, you know, hey guys, like, I know, I know this game didn't go so well, you know, bummer. And then like, I'll talk about something else, you know, whatever. And sometimes I'll say, have a great weekend or this or that, you know what I mean? Just being as personal as I can be because I want people to feel like I'm talking to them. So, so yes, I mean, I, I still write all those individual email blasts that go out and I don't think I'd ever want to change that, but even by yourself with a system like that, it goes to show that you can still set up all these different automated flows and just focus on the bigger campaigns as often as you want. And that so. is huge, right? The fact that you have the automation, but then you're able to still personalize pieces of it. And that goes even not just for the e-commerce marketing, that goes for other items too. When, when you look at even Airbnb management, right? Like as, as listeners know, I have a couple of Airbnbs and I have automated messages that go out to the guests. But at times, if a guest lets us know, hey, it's going to be their birthday, I'll edit some of those automated messages so it, it's more personal. It's like, hey, happy birthday, da, 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 da. I hope you have an awesome weekend. Let us know if we can do anything, right? Or I'll, I'll send a personalized message. And, and it sounds a lot like what you're doing because those personal touches are really what people love and, and what they came for to begin with. And I want to get one comment because there's still a lot to cover. But yeah, it makes it more personal, which is which is incredible, man. And from a, from a social media aspect, again, this is the one that really drew me into your work, seeing it, you know, the improvement over time and just the different leaps and bounds that you were going to, to create these pieces. What do you recommend for there? You mentioned email should be minimum once per month, but ideally on a weekly basis, if you can, but roughly once per month. What about social media? It's an ever-changing game, right? That, that can be a full-time job in itself, keeping up with changing algorithms and like what's working, what's not, you know, and that goes for Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, Twitter. Something I, I actually need to tap into is LinkedIn. I get so many notifications on there because I do have a page, but I'm like never on there. But man, I, I could probably blow that thing up really, really well and, uh, ex, you know, send out so many requests on there for people that I'm already connected with. But I think the, the more, the better, but don't pressure yourself, you know, don't make that number one but make content and try to be authentic, try to be raw, not worrying about the particulars too much. Just like how I mentioned earlier with not getting too caught up in like when you're building out your website, all the little details that don't actually matter that nobody's thinking about, just have something there, launch it and worry about all the details afterwards. I'm actually, I have this big pending contract project, this group of guys, company, NFT related. And I try to get on their weekly calls to just give my own input and my own, you know, wisdom from the NFT world. And they're so caught up in all these little details for the platform that they're building. And the overall 
uh, theme that's starting to build that I didn't, I didn't say it, but now they're finally realizing as well as like, Hey, let's get this out there because some of these things we're going to, we're going to tweak and realize once it's actually running, once we have people coming to the website, it's not, nothing matters until people are there and then you can learn from there. You know what I mean? So I always, I always recommend to people, Hey, just do it, get it done, launch it, and then edit from there. And I get caught up in it too, still to this day, sometimes, you know what I mean? Same and I got to catch myself. <laughs> Same so. here. And even, even when you look at like this podcast, right? If you look at the earlier episodes versus the later episodes, there's a major difference, right? And, mm -hmm. and even the way that we, we kind of have the flow and how we edit and the intros and things of that nature. And it's just what you said. You need to first get your minimally viable product out there. Same thing that Steve Jobs always did right back in the day. And then once you start getting customer feedback and, and people that are actually using it, you can edit from there. But until you get it out there, you could, you could drive yourself crazy trying to find the exact color of the background and the perfect mm. music that you oh. want to put in. <laughs> and, and I do it too with you. I'm right along oh, here with man. you. Yeah. <laughs> I hate it. I hate it. Um, but, but, but one yeah. thing you mentioned, one thing you mentioned just now is you're doing, a, you're starting to move into a little bit of the digital world, but they're calling the metaverse and, and doing some, some NFT projects. And I just got to say, you're one of the few people that I personally know that I've actually had conversations with around this that has helped me better understand it because I'm still a novice, a, a, a straight beginner when it comes to the NFT world. But would you mind first defining kind of in your own terms what an nft is and and then kind of how an nft owner gets paid yeah I, I mean i feel like the nft definition and and what it represents i like the way to explain it i have on lock you know and i feel like i understood it pretty quickly when i found out about it and the thing about nfts is people like feel like what is an nft non-fungible token what does that mean and it, it does sound so complex, but it's not complex at all. It's actually very powerful and, and it's a really great thing that exists. But the way that I like to explain it from the art perspective, the art world is that it's, it's a glorified certificate of authenticity, right? So like when I sell something limited edition or even an original, sometimes I'll include like some sort of certificate of authenticity to say, hey, this is legit. This is the one. You know what I mean? And then you get that included with your item. Now, the NFT is the same exact thing, but it's, it's coding on something called the blockchain, which is powerful technology. Blockchain is what, is what Bitcoin exists on and other cryptos. And that is how it exists in the digital world, right? It's just a digital ledger. It's a, it's a code for that NFT or the NFT is a, a piece of artwork that you made but it just has a digital code to it. So, and that digital code is actually publicly sourceable data that you or I can go look up, you know, oh, Joe bought this painting. Well, let's see if he owns the NFT contract for it. Yes, he does. And we can look that up. And that's very powerful because it eliminates a lot of copycats and a lot of fakes out there that exist, especially in like the memorabilia world and like fake signature, fake hand sign stuff, whatever it is. So it's very powerful from that perspective. And then something else that's really cool, and, and it varies with each blockchain, um, but Ethereum is really the main, so the main smart contract crypto out there. And a smart contract is something that is attached to the NFT that says, hey, this is the benefit of creating this NFT for the owner, right? So I can... I can set the smart contract for a drawing that I do to be, let's say, 10% royalty, right? I sell that NFT to you. And every sale after that, you resell that, I get 10% of that transaction. You buy, you know, I sell a painting for $10,000 and then somebody sells it in a year for $100,000, I wish. I get, I get a 10% of that, which is another $10,000. You know what I mean? So that's the power and the beauty of it is it is it empowers the creatives, the musicians, the anybody, you know what I mean? And I can guarantee you, we already talked about it and I'm sure it's already happening that I haven't seen, but this is going to apply to real estate. This is going to apply to every aspect of the world as we know it. And it's only a matter of time. So 
that's that's the best way that I can explain NFTs. No, and 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 that explanation is golden because you helped me finally come around to the fact that hey, he's right, man. This is a, a truly powerful method to show ownership of things in the past that could be forged relatively easily. And the one example that we talked about as well was even, you know, like NFL season ticket holders, right? We can definitely see a future where, hey, we're going to create X amount of season tickets and it's going to exist on the blockchain. And if you want to sell your season ticket, you can do that. But now the NFL is going to get royalties on that season ticket being sold. And now you know, hey, this isn't a fake. This is the one and only. And here goes the trail leading to that. So it, it, there's so many use cases. And if the NFL does that, they need to pay both of us. But there's so <laughs> many use cases. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm steadily watching and, and learning through you, through osmosis, so that I can find a way to, to try to tap into this NFT world and, and blockchain as well. Because this is, uh, it's the future, man. It's pretty exciting. Yeah, absolutely. And and like I said, there's so many use cases for it. The the main that you've seen and most people have seen up until this point is art and music, and that'll continue to evolve as well. So, and then, you know, you have, you have representation of just pure art. People are buying it because they love to look at it. They like how it looks. And then you've got projects that have a bunch of utility attached to holding that NFT, you know? You're holding something that gives you access to this. You're holding something that gives you, you know, membership into something. So those are the other kind of scenarios that you see a lot. Yeah. And, and Jordan, we're getting close to the end in the last couple questions. But before we ask those questions, I really want to just say thank you for the work that you've been doing. A lot of people may have seen the Kobe piece I have, and if they haven't, they're going to see it because we're going to include it in the show notes. And it's amazing. Oh, nice. This is an incredible piece <laughs> that, that you did right after the passing of the legend in 2020. And I have it hanging right at the entrance of, of my wall. And I know the values continue to go up as you continue to do more projects. So I plan to keep this for a while, man. And Love and no, <laughs> no, the work that you do is incredible, seriously. And if those, for those who haven't seen it yet, definitely check out the show notes, click the link, and you're going to be able to go check out Spectre Sports Art and see kind of what he's got going on. Yeah, man, thank you for having me and allowing me to talk about the, the nitty gritty and, and the, the rise to the occasion. And, you know, it's all, it's all fun to talk about. And I love to, I love to put it out there. Come on now. <laughs> and I got... Two more questions. One, how can our listeners and, and viewers help you? What are some of your goals in 2022 and how can they help you achieve those goals? Wow. Well, I would say if, if you like what you heard and you want to follow along with my work, you can follow my social media pages. You threw out my company name. It's also my website, spectrusportsart.com. And then on Twitter and Instagram, at specter underscore art feel free to follow me on there engage with my posts if you want hit me up on there i'm pretty responsive that's really it you know i'm 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 thankful and grateful for people that not only buy stuff but just engage with my work and show some sort of support you know so you don't have to buy something you can just follow along you know and engage you know so absolutely absolutely and i said one more question, but really I got two more. One, where are you based right now? Because we talked about it before, but but where are you sitting right now? I am in Costa Rica at the <laughs> moment. <laughs> and 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 I, I'm guessing that you're not shipping prints from Costa Rica to, to all over the world, people that are buying. How are you getting, when somebody places the order, how are you getting it to them? What are, what What systems have you put in place? Well, it depends what it is, but if it's an original project, like I have a partnership with Fanatics and then I have scattered commission jobs that I do, but that is usually, you know, hand done by me. And then I'm figuring out a way to get it to them. And that requires my physical presence. But for most reproductions or prints, I, are, I spent years putting in place a whole fulfillment team that you know makes the artwork on demand packages it ships it out and then customer service along with that as well and it depends what it is some of it we have stock of already that i've upfront paid to have made or some of it like i like i said is print on demand which is very powerful for any artist or anybody 
printing some product when you can, or t-shirts or other products that you can print your image on or your creation on. Um, that, you know, that's the name of the game today because one lesson I did learn early on was don't have overhead, especially for t-shirts because I, I dabbled with t-shirts for a little bit and I had a bunch of t-shirts that I invested that I made. And then I had to sit on them for like a year or two. But I, I'm, I think I still have a box of t-shirts from all the way back then that I never sold. So <laughs> that was an important lesson to learn for me to hey. get something like that in place. Well, I will take a t-shirt, right? And I'm definitely going to hound you for that. But one, one last question for me, and this is about some of your future projects. I saw a video drop, I think it was yesterday or two days ago. And I'm like, hold up, man, what's he doing now? What's a project that you're working on? I know you got plenty, but one that you're really excited about that's going to be coming out here, you know, the next couple of weeks. Next couple of weeks, I'd say more so next couple of months, but I'm working on a a Sixers mural that it's a very similar concept to the Eagles thing that I did. It it just represents the entire history of the Sixers and all the, the best players ever, including MB, because he, he deserves to be in there and that's who my client wanted as well but this gentleman actually owns an indoor gym basketball court full size <laughs> on his estate and uh, you know he reached out to me to see if I could put together this masterpiece and I'm always up for the challenge so that's that's one of the bigger things I'm working on probably and probably what I'm most excited about but I have a ton of other commission work as well which I I will post on my page for the most part some stuff I can put out there but most of it I can but that's definitely the most exciting one currently that I'm working on. That is dope. I can't <clears throat> wait to see it, especially in the gym. And I think you should go and play that guy one-on-one -on -one too, man. You got to, you got to Chris in the court <laughs> once that thing is up there. But Jordan, in all seriousness, again, just want to say thank you for taking time out from the beaches of Costa Rica to, to join the Financial Mastermind podcast. And no, we appreciate you, man. And we look forward to continuing to follow your journey all the way to the top. And just like he said, please follow Jordan's pages. Definitely want to see this journey and continue to order and support his business the same way that you support us. Jordan, thank you. Thank you, man.